to Mushroom Wonderland. focus stacking and so that's combining a whole bunch of pictures into one picture and so what I do is I'll uh, set up the tripod and take a picture and I open the aperture all the way and turn the ISO all the way down so that gives me a really high quality picture but it's a very thin slice so if I was to close the aperture I would get more depth of field but that makes everything a little bit blurry um, and so if I... How thin are the slices? What's that? How thin are the slices? How thin are the slices? As thin as I can get them, because uh, I open the aperture all the way, but the actual thickness depends entirely on the distance of, uh, between the subject and the camera. Mm -hmm. So, like in this one here, this is an entheloma that I shot this afternoon with ultraviolet light, and um, I focused the camera all the way close. And so the slices are very thin, and then the further away they get, the, th the thicker each slice gets. Um, so, you know, it starts off probably less than a millimeter and, uh, and then by the end it's probably like two or three millimeters per slice. So I'm going to start the stack right here. This is the first picture. And if I, uh, what I did is I just loaded all these photos into Adobe Bridge and I can flip through them and you can see the different parts start coming into focus. So you can see the stem starts coming into focus, and if I keep going, then the gills start coming into focus. And then I put a, um, I, you know, I shot this at like 3 p.m., so there was a lot of direct sunlight, so I used this black velvet um, and just kind of put it right over the top of the mushroom and just kind of shined the light under the velvet. So um, that's why the background is black. Uh, but if I keep flipping through here, I'll try to figure out when the last, uh, the last image that has something in focus is. And that is around, around here. Uh, but that leaves the velvet behind this still very blurry. So that's really nice because it makes it easy to get a real solid black background. So that was image 3340. And I'll start with 3280. So if I select all those, um, then I just drag them into Helicon. And so Helicon is a program where it takes all these images. Here we have 63 images. And it compares them all to see which parts of the image have the highest contrast. And those parts are the part that are in focus. And so then if I hit render, it'll just take the in focus parts of all of these and make, give me an output image where everything is in focus at once. So you can see, oh, yeah. <laughs> so the results that I get from this are really good. It's like finally my photos are coming out the way I want them to come out. And you can combine any number of pictures. You can get infinite depth of field. But since the aperture is all the way open, then the background is very blurry. So the subject stands out really well from the background. Um, it used to be that I would close the aperture down to get more depth of field. But when you close the aperture, then you get more depth of field, but everything in the whole field becomes blurry, and you can't always get enough depth of field to get the whole mushroom in focus. Um, so having the aperture all the way open gives me a whole lot more detail um, than I had before. So what I'll do now is save this. I'll save it as a tip. And then load that TIFF into Photoshop. <laughs> and so here's this image, and if I zoom in all the way, you can see it looks like this. So we get really good detail. And you can see all the little tiny things, like uh, this right here are pieces of uh, people's clothing, so microplastics. Oh, wow. And microplastics are ubiquitous in the environment. It's very rare that I pick a mushroom that doesn't have any microplastics on it. Mm -hmm. 
Um, you can see they're they're kind of all over. Hmm. What sort of plastics? Uh, I would guess polyethylene. Um, but this is the so this is the ultraviolet one, and then I also have the exact same picture that I took with white light. And what I'll do later is I will stack the white light one, and then I'll um, open up Photoshop, drag them into a, a layer, and align them so I get the exact same image with white light and ultraviolet. And that way I can throw them into a PowerPoint, and you can see the uh, parts of the image that are uh, you can see like each part of the image and which part fluoresces the different colors. Um, but I find that if I'm, if it's worth photographing, um, then it's worth focus stacking. And if it's something that I don't want to spend the time to focus stack on, then I'll just use my cell phone. And the cell phones give pretty good pictures for large mushrooms. Um, sometimes if it's a real big mushroom, I can't even tell the difference between an expensive camera photo and a cell phone photo. Uh, but for really tiny mushrooms, uh, there's really no comparison. And so now I'm going to show you a few of my recent, uh, more recent pictures. And so here's an Amanita muscaria. Uh, this is how they start out. And so this is growing mycorrhizal with pine. And then after about a week, the, that button <laughs> opens up. And so what you're seeing here is the egg, and they hatch out of the egg. And this covering is called the universal veil. So that universal veil breaks up and it makes the concentric rings on the base of the stem and it also makes all of these warts on the cap. Mm. And so this uh, is Amanita muscaria subspecies Flavi vulvata and I can tell because it has yellow veil remnants. So the sun bleaches it white really quickly. Uh, but most of our ones in North America have these yellow veil remnants but you might have some in Washington that don't have any yellow at all and those are the European Amanita muscaria. Uh, so these I brought uh, brought home and brought it to the laboratory and cloned it to agar. And this is a standard malt extract agar. And so amanitas are ectomycorrhizal, which means that you cannot grow them in the lab. Uh, at least you can't fruit them, but you can grow the mycelium just fine. So if you take a little bit of amanita and you throw it on the plate, they will grow, but extremely slowly. So you'll know you have the right thing if the mycelium only grows about one centimeter per month. Oh my uh, but I threw one of those plates on the microscope and took a picture of the mycelium. So this is the Amanita muscaria mycelium that's growing across the agar. And you can see it's really cool looking. Another cool thing that I found recently is Tirana cerulea. And uh, this stick was found by Gordon Walker at the Nama Foray in Missouri about three weeks ago. And it's probably the driest foray I've ever been to. There's a severe drought over most of the country. Um, but in, um, you know, these crust fungi are some of the only ones that are still there. So this crust was absolutely beautiful. Mm. There's this bright cobalt blue. And so I uh, grabbed a little bit of it and I brought it to Washington here and did some microscopy. And it turns out it looks really cool in the microscope as well. And so this is the crust um, and um, I tried mounting it in potassium hydroxide and this brilliant blue color turned green, kind of an ugly shade of green. Um, so this is mounted in white wine. Uh, so that's magnified a hundred times and it's just the natural color. So the, the orange and yellow is the wood and then the blue is the crust fungus. And then um, magnified 400 times, it looks like this. And then we did some dark field microscopy on it last night and got this cool moon shaped thing. And then here it is magnified a thousand times right where the crust attaches to the wood. So it's one of the most beautiful things. And we have, I have some of this crust downstairs, so we'll have to mount some tonight and people can look at it. Because it's really just breathtaking to pan around with all this cobalt blue mycelium. Uh, one of the cool finds from yesterday was this Gibalula, and so this was found on a spider. Um, this particular one was on a Salal leaf, and so I didn't feel like taking my microscope or my camera off my microscope, so I just um, used the two times objective on my microscope and left the camera sitting on top and just took a whole bunch of pictures and I shined some light down from above using the regular compound scope. 
and I was able to focus stack this picture of the gibbalula growing on the spider. And then here is a, another gibbalula growing on a spider. I think this one was found on a fern frond leaf yesterday over at Ledbetter. Uh, but really cool looking things. And so I took uh, one of those little horns that was coming off it and magnified it a thousand times last night. And so this is what the edge looks like. Um, so definitely cool looking things. It doesn't look anything like any of the other mushrooms I've ever looked at. And there's a lot of cool stuff you can see at night with an ultraviolet light. And maybe after my talk, if people want, we can try walking around here with some ultraviolet lights and see what we can turn up. But scorpions are one of the most fluorescent things, and you can see them from about 100 meters away. Uh, so this is a picture that I took at the Alabama Mushroom Festival um, that was two weeks ago. And so this is Viahova carolinensis, uh, the only scorpion in Alabama. Around here we have Euronoctis mordax, uh, which is our only west coast scorpion. It's not a very dangerous scorpion, uh, but super bright. Um, Another photography tip is that when you're taking pictures of mushrooms, you can add some decoration to make them look better. <laughs> so usually what I'll do is um, when I find some mushrooms, I'll add some cones and some needles from whatever tree it's associating with. So like pine cones and fir needles. Um, and so that way you can just look at the mushroom and see the, uh, see the host tree. Uh, but in this case, I added a rattlesnake. <laughs> so this is Cortalis basiliscus, um, is guarding Amanita basii. This is one of those really cool edible Amanitas that you get um, in Mexico. And they're very popular there. Um, in fact, you can order this Amanita in restaurants. Uh, so really closely related to the Amanita caesarea that's in Europe. And is very popular over there. How close did you get to the snake? What's that? How close did you get to the snake? Uh, well, I was using a 100, meter, 100 millimeter macro lens at the time, okay. so not close at all. Um, I was probably like six feet away from the snake, and it was kind of a short snake, so that was a safe distance. Um, but actually, the snake was caught by, uh, by this guy. He, he's the husband of Laura Guzman, who's uh, one, of, one of the best mycologists in Mexico, and his name is Fanti. And so he, we were on a mushroom hunt with all of them, and he came up, and his, his mushroom basket was buzzing, and he had the snake in it. And so we walked around until we found some mushrooms, and then he put the snake in front of the mushrooms. And he studies rattlesnakes for a living, so he's able to do it safely. Um, in fact, he had not been bitten by any rattlesnakes for at least the past six months. <laughs> Uh, but he grabs them like right behind the head so they can't reach around and uh, he didn't get bit that day either. Uh, here's one that I like a lot. This is Alloclavaria purpurea, or at least one of the undescribed species that we call Alloclavaria purpurea. And this is a photo that I took um, at uh, Pacific Pines, which is where we went mushroom hunting today, just a five minute drive from here. Uh, but really beautiful thing, and you can see that the mushrooms in perfect focus and the background is really blurry, so this is definitely one of the focus stacked photos. Um, and then uh, about a year ago I went to the Netherlands and uh, found some pretty cool stuff there. One of them was these Armillaria rhizomorphs. So this is a photo I took in ultraviolet light, and then the same photo in white light looks like this. And so these are just these black shoelace things um, from the honey mushrooms. And so I always like to take the same photo with ultraviolet and white light so you can flip between them. Um, the other thing I did here is I held the photo, uh, held the light at a very sharp angle so that gives you a lot of uh, per the perception of depth because you get the shadows going across it. Uh, another cool thing our malaria does is it glows in the dark. And so here are some plates that Hart Singer gave me. And so I just took them into the bathroom and did a long exposure. And these are making their own light. And then uh, a real quick exposure looks like this. So you can see these are some really uh, very scary looking plates. And so these are the same rhizomorphs we were seeing before um, that you just see on tree trunks. But they also make the rhizomorphs on agar. And then the kind of these spots where the mycelium surfaces are the parts uh, that were glowing. And so sometimes you'll see this if you're like digging around uh, kind of like uh, rotten trees at night, you'll see these uh, 
kind of glowing rhizomorphs, so glowing mycelium uh, in there. So this is one of the most common glowing mushrooms in Washington. Another common one is Pinellus stipticus, and then we have several species of mycena in Washington that glow in the dark. Though most of them are very dim, so not many people in Washington look for bioluminescent mushrooms. Here is an Upamopsis aggregata. Um, this is the cool flower that I saw in Arizona. Uh, the mushroom season in Arizona this year was spectacular. Uh, probably the best mushroom season they've had in many years. Uh, last year was also spectacular. And so these people found this really cool purple mushroom in Arizona. And they sequenced the DNA and they found that it was Entolum occidentale varmentalicum, which is uh, very rare and very beautiful. And it was described from Oregon, uh, but it's only been found there a couple times. Um, but anyways, they found it and they let some people know and it ended up hitting the news. And there was all these newspaper articles written about these mushroom hunters that found this rare purple mushroom. And then when I was wandering around Arizona about two months ago, I saw this purple mushroom and I said, oh wow, this might be that same one that made the news. And so I collected it and um, sequenced the DNA at a barcoding, DNA barcoding workshop that I did at Telluride Mushroom Festival. And it turned out that it was a perfect match for the Arizona ones. Um, so it's Entoloma occidentale var metallicum. Hey, Alan. Yep. Touching back to Penelis Stipticus. Mm -hmm. I heard from the bathroom, yeah. you talking about it glowing here. Have you ever found fruits here that successfully glow? Well, people say that Penelis Stipticus on the west coast does not glow in the dark, but on the east coast it does. Uh, but I found some in Sonoma County, and I have a good photo of it glowing from there. So um, I haven't checked the Washington ones yet, but I'm going to guess that all the West Coast ones actually do glow, and people just haven't noticed it. I found some. Maybe they were a bit dry. But I they definitely need to be fresh, and they start glowing again when you rehydrate them. Uh, yeah, they do. Uh, the Robotomyces that we see around here is the same uh, that they uh, have in Europe, and it's Robotomyces raritus. And those have those beautiful uh, stems that are covered in slime. And so those mushrooms don't glow at all, but the mycelium glows. Um, so I took some into the bathroom at Soma Camp and got some nice long exposure ones of that Robotomyces growing off of an acorn. And so the whole acorn was glowing. And so... Um, yeah, the, the, all that West Coast stuff is the same, and uh, it's not very bright, uh, but they do. Uh, another one is like Mycena haematopus, the mycelium, mycelium of that glows, and Mycena pyra. Um, actually, quite a few Mycenas glow, uh, but most of them in the colder areas, only, only the mycelium glows. So if you're going to see it glow, it's just the stem base. Uh, one of the coolest ones I've seen is this really slimy Mycena that I found at Ecola State Park. Uh, maybe it's Mycena vulgaris, uh, but it smelled like cat urine and very slimy cap and very slimy stem. And that's the only mushroom I've seen that's both fluorescent and bioluminescent. So with the black light, it lights up a whole bunch of different colors, like this bright yellow stem base, and then you turn the lights off and it makes its own light on the stem bases. Uh, another name for that might be Mycena quinaltensis. Um, so I, people say it's a species cluster, and I think that's probably true because some of them don't glow and some of them don't smell like cat piss. So it'd be interesting to sequence all these and see see where they all come out. This one here is Paneola cyanescens. Um, these are some that I photographed in my friend's closet a couple months ago. And so these, I have a really cool uh, ultraviolet, uh, you know, they glow bright yellow and ultraviolet, both fresh and dried. Oh, yeah, here's the, the fresh photo. Um, so he was growing these in, in some horse manure. And then here's some hallucinogenic plants. This one is a Brugmansia. So this one has, uh, usually gives an extremely unpleasant effect because it has scopalamine. So it makes you hallucinate, but these hallucinations are kind of difficult to tell from reality. So a lot of times people uh, end up hallucinating for a couple days and going into the hospital. But interestingly, this does the exact opposite thing to uh, your GABA receptors as the inosibi, um, the inosibi chemical muscarin. So if you get poisoned by muscarin, you can eat some of this uh, deterra type stuff and it reverses the effects. And if you get poisoned by inosibi, you can eat some um, 
you can use them to throw, and vice versa, um, and they reverse mm -hmm. each other. Weird. Mm -hmm. And then this one here is a Calocera viscosa, and this one was from the Netherlands. Um, this one I lit from behind, and makes it look kind of cool. Mushrooms generally look really cool with light coming from behind. You can see a lot more texture than if you just blast them with light from the front. Um, so this one was just kind of lit naturally uh, with light that was kind of filtering from behind. But I like to carry these LED lights and they're super useful whether you're using a cell phone or an expensive camera to add some more light. And it's really cool to take these and put the lights behind the mushroom or way off to the side and it gives you all these shadows and it gives you really, really nice effects. Mm -hmm. um, it's really fun just to kind of look through your viewfinder as you move the lights around. And you can see there's certain spots where you put the lights and the mushroom just looks awesome. And then other spots where you put the lights and the mushroom looks stupid even though it's the same mushroom <laughs> in the same spot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here is a Coltricia, really tiny one um, that Jordan Jacobs found when they were on our Mexico trip uh, about a month ago in Veracruz. That's not Coltriciella? No, the Coltriciellas, they, uh, they grow directly from wood and they kind of hang down like little shower heads. And then the Coltricia kind of have a regular mushroom form and they grow up from like the ground or well decayed wood. Uh, but the Coltriciella I found a whole lot of in West Pennsylvania about a week ago. And I found more than I've ever seen. I got like 10 grams of it or something. Um, there was massive ones. And we saw some in Alabama too. Um, but there was one Coltriciella from uh, California that Allison Polak photographed and gave me and I sequenced it. And it didn't match any other Coltriciella sequences. But it clustered with all the other Coltriciella sequences. So those definitely need more work. So if you see any Coltriciella, definitely photograph it and hang on to it. This thing here is a Gallerina. I don't think it has a name yet, but it's from the cloud forests of Veracruz. And I like the really sharp spine that's always on top. So it's like one of these little tiny Gallerinas. And it turns out that uh, you know, a lot of the Gallerinas are deadly poisonous, but only the really big ones like Gallerina marginata. And all of these real small ones that grow on moss or just kind of in forest debris, they don't have the deadly uh, amatoxins that the marginata group does. So it turns out that about 95% of gallerina is probably edible. And then one of them contains psilocybin. Are those toxins all <laughs> ribosome toxins? Or? Yeah, they, there's those alpha aminidins that gum up your ribosomes. So if you eat them, nothing happens for 12 hours because you have enough proteins. But when your ribosomes get gummed up, you can't make any new proteins. So after about 12 hours, you get really sick and then after about a week you die. Um, although you don't always die anymore because they can replace your liver, uh, but a new liver is about $800,000 with installation, so it's best to just identify your mushrooms first. Um, this is one that is from Southern California, uh, no, this one's from Southern Mexico, and this one was recently described as Mycena guzmanii. And it sure looks like a Robitomyces, but genetically it's a lot closer to Resinomycena. So we just described it in the genus Mycena. Uh, but this one, um, occasionally the mushroom glows in the dark and always the mycelium glows in the dark. So uh, this one's super common, like just walking through the cloud forest, you'll see thousands of them and it makes all the leaves glow. So sometimes just like walking through the cloud forest at night, you'll see hundreds of thousands of glowing leaves just all over the place. And it looks like the ocean floor or stars or something it ends up looking really cool. Mm -hmm. And then here's a metarhizium. Um, this is one that I found in Veracruz about a month ago. And so these metarhiziums like to kill beetles. And in fact, they work so well that Monsanto started selling it. And the one that they are selling is called Met 52, Metarhizium bruneum. Um, this one I collected and then somebody lost it and couldn't find it again, so I'll probably never figure out what this one was. Uh, but uh, the interesting one about the one Monsanto is selling is that they sell it as like a biopesticide. So you could buy like these strong chemicals to kill insects, or you could uh, just use metarhizium spores. And so you're supposed to like take these. Um, these metarhizium spores, it's like this black oil that you get from Monsanto and mix it with water, like a teaspoon for five gallons, and you spray that around. And it uh, infects a lot of insects and kills them. 
Um, so that's kind of cool because it's a much uh, more ecological way to control pests. Uh, but also recently they found that these uh, the same species of metarhizium that Monsanto is selling it also makes a lot of ergot alkaloids at very high levels. So clandestine LSD chemists could use uh, that fungus to, um, to manufacture uh, ergot alkaloids and manufacture LSD. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so somebody bought this Monsanto product and she gave me a couple drops of it and I threw it on auger and it fired up a culture and it looks really cool on auger um, there's like these concentric zones of yellow spores and green spores here is a pseudobiospora and pseudobiospora are really cool uh, because there's a lot of them and they're very tiny but they're extremely mysterious because nobody ever studies them uh, I doubt anyone's ever eaten any of them, but there's a lot of species on the west coast and they kind of grow in cool habitats like under cypress or red, redwood. This particular one is Pseudobiospora decori uh, because it turns bright green in KOH. Um, but it also looks really cool in ultraviolet. I think I'll have a photo of that somewhere. You can find them in the winter here under big maple leaves. Sometimes. Really? Under big maple? Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I found a bright red one in Mexico. Um, also, I think there was a lot of maple around there. Um, this one is kind of cool. It's Mycena phyllopes, at least what we call Mycena phyllopes. But the real Mycena phyllopes was described from Europe, and it has about 25 base pairs difference in the ITS genes. So that's quite a few differences. So with that many differences, you could definitely make the argument that this should be called something else. This is one of our most common inosibes, and you'll see it all over the place, all the time. And when you pick it, you smell it, and it smells like iodine. Uh, smells really strongly like iodine tincture. Uh, but a really cool thing about it is that it's brightly fluorescent. So the same photo with ultraviolet light, it looks very cool. And it also has these really cool rhizomorphs on the stem base. And here's some Ganoderma. Um, turns out that you can use ultraviolet lights to identify Ganoderma species. Uh, so in the middle we have Ganoderma suge, and then the Mickey Mouse ears are Ganoderma lobatum. And so Ganoderma lobatum turns bright blue uh, in ultraviolet light, and then the Ganoderma suge in the varnished parts you get green colors, and then the pore surface you get more red colors. Um, so all those varnished Ganodermas give you really good colors. And then Ganoderma aplanatum gives you, um, get, you get blue, but only on the edge of the pore surface, like not in the middle, like Ganoderma lobatum. So you can just like go through the Ganoderma lobatum uh, tray at, fun at fungus fairs and separate out the aplanatum really easily. And I'm really curious what, uh, what brownie eye does, because there's some question as to whether we have aplanatum or brownie eye or both on the west coast and how to sort those out. Sequences of pancake stack Ganoderma show that aplanatum can be uh, pancake stack, but it's believed that on some hardwoods we do have it. I don't know of any sequences. Yeah, there was a lady who was studying uh, Ganoderma at UC Davis, and she said the only place in California that she had found aplanatum was on almond trees, which seems really unusual. Uh, aplanatum but or brownie? Aplanatum. Huh. Yeah. Um, but the only one that I've sequenced is Ganoderma brownii, and that was growing on bay. And so that one definitely came back as brownii. And, um, and so it's, it's a real thing. Uh, be, it will be cool to figure out how to try to tell them apart. Um, so a lot of times when I'm out, I like to photograph other stuff like butterflies. So this is one of those glass wing butterflies. And um, it had just hatched out of its chrysalis. So the, the wings are very transparent here. And then here's a cordyceps from Guadalajara. Um, found this about three months ago in a place called Barranca de Huantetan. And the cordyceps experts say that it's probably an undescribed species of cordyceps uh, growing on a butterfly pupa. And here are some hemimycena. And hemimycenas are really cool. They're these tiny white ones. We saw some today um, on our hunt. And there's a lot of them, and they're all very beautiful. And um, with the macro lens, you can kind of tell them apart, even without microscopy and sequencing. And it turns out they're not a monophyletic group. Um, there's a, a few different groups, so they'll be split up. Um, 
but they're very tiny and so um, it's really important to focus stack them. Uh, the smaller a mushroom is, the more important it is to focus stack them. So I could have tried to take a picture like this by uh, closing my aperture down to like f32, but it wouldn't come out very well at all. So this is about 90 photos combined together. And then this one is really cool because it has just very few gills, uh, almost a lamellate. So this one is Hemimycena crispula, and uh, this one kind of occurs. And here is Hohenbuchelia mastrucata. Uh, Hohenbuchelia are really cool kind of oyster-like things. Um, around here, the main one that people see is Hohenbuchelia petaloides, though Danny Miller <laughs> says that Actually, all of our West Coast petaloides is uh, something else, probably undescribed, but some other group. Uh, but the Mastricata, I think, is the real one. Uh, but these are some, these turn up on the West Coast as well, and also some other ones that look really similar, but are genetically pretty far. Uh, but these things um, just have a really cool cap texture, and so uh, they make really good subjects for macro photography. And here's some Deconica. This one is like Deconica Montana. And some people find that when they shine ultraviolet lights at Deconica gills, um, they turn bright red. I've never seen that. I always shine ultraviolet lights at my Deconica gills and they usually turn green. And then the red is usually somewhere else. Uh, here's the undescribed psilocybe from, uh, from the mountains of California. This uh, never opens up. Um, so these, again, I photographed it using the black velvet but really cool looking thing, kind of closely related to Psilocybe Hopii. And then this is one that I've been wanting to find for a long time and I finally caught up with it about a month ago in Veracruz. And this is Ceratiomyxa morkella. So it's a slime mold, so close, more closely related to amoebas than it is to fungi. Uh, but they look like little morels and they hang down from the undersides of logs and they have these awesome, just completely transparent glass-like stems. So as soon as I found it, I knew exactly what it was and I was like, wow, it's this thing that I've been looking for for years. And so I sat down and spent 10 minutes photographing it and all the other people came back to find me um, and that was nice of them. <laughs> but I was just gonna let him go because there was no way I wasn't gonna photograph that. But they were super tiny things there, like about a couple millimeters tall. And then here is a terrible photo of Lacaria amethystio occidentalis. And so this is our really uh, big west coast Lacaria. It's got a really cool stem texture. Uh, but the reason it's a terrible photo is because I found it in the shade, but then back behind me there was a bright sunlit clearing. So there was just like a little bit of light on the mushroom and then a whole lot of light in the background and that's a sure way to ruin any photo. So what I did is I took a piece of black velvet and hung it in the bushes behind me and then took the same picture again with the same settings and got this. So you can see how much it changed. Uh, a really dramatic improvement just by throwing this black cloth uh, up behind the mushroom. And so I took a couple more with the black cloth. Cool. And here's kind of a cool one. Uh, this is like Leptonia. I forget if they're trying to call it Carnea or Subsondrizii now. Uh, but has these, uh, it's like this bright blue Leptonia and it has these uh, water droplets on it. And these droplets are like really fluorescent. So pretty cool looking thing. Um, but I found this thing and then I was walking through the woods um, a couple miles away from the trailhead and ran into Damon Tai. And so I pulled my tackle box out and showed him my tackle box and he shined the black light on it and saw these like really cool droplets. So I was uh, very happy that I ran into him. Hmm. Um, here's another kind of cool one. This one I ran into in Amsterdam uh, about 10 months ago, and this one is Psilocybe liniformans. Uh, so it's a really rare Psilocybe species that grows on dung in Europe. Probably the first good photos of it. And occasionally I see cool plants, and so I'll throw them in the black velvet too, and uh, take some pictures of them. This is Clintonia andrusii, which is an orchid, and it makes these awesome blueberries, which don't taste very good. 
So it is safe to taste any mushroom. It is not safe to taste any plant. Mm -hmm. So anytime I find a plant and I don't know what it is, the first thing I do is I pop it in my mouth. And um, that's very dangerous and that's, um, that's good because I like dangerous things. <laughs> and it also um, kind of gives me an idea of what kind of chemicals are in the plant and helps me remember it. Um, so you definitely shouldn't do that because it's not safe. And I found out firsthand that it's not safe when I was in a botanical garden in Tucson. And I saw this really cool thing. Um, it was in the grape family. And it was from South Africa. And I had never seen it before. So I grabbed a leaf and started chewing on it. And about five seconds later, I got this ext extremely intense pain in my mouth. And it mm -hmm. felt like I was being cut by little swords. Mm -hmm. And indeed, that's exactly what was happening. It had these calcium oxalate crystals. And they're very sharp uh, needles. And so they um, just slice your tongue up. And it really hurt, and I was wondering how long the pain would last, and the answer was about five minutes. Um, but I think there's some other ones that like last like all day or something. So um, don't try that at home, uh, or do, as long as you uh, know that you might die. <laughs> Uh, some of the plants are poisonous, and they have, like there's uh, they're so poisonous that there's no known low dosage for the toxicity, like the uh, water hemlock that cause all the muscles in your body to contract, and it's one of the most painful deaths known to man. And there's no amount so small that people don't like um, that people like know that it's a safe amount. So I don't know how much of that you could chew without dying. Probably not very much, um, but I do know somebody who tasted it, and he said it, and he was fine. <laughs> uh, but I wouldn't taste that one. Uh, I also really want, I'm trying to get the courage up to taste poison oak because I'm really curious what it tastes like. Uh, I don't react to poison oak, so in theory I should be able to taste it, but I just uh, haven't, haven't been able to make myself do that yet. Uh, this one here is Exobasidium vicinii. Uh, no, Exobasidium arctostaphyli. So this is a manzanita plant, arctostaphylis. And then the, it gets turned red by this fungus. And so the fungus is the Exobasidium. And so it makes these awesome uh, red shoots. And so this one I collected, and I'll try to do some microscopy and sequencing to see if it's maybe some other species of Exobasidium, like the people on iNaturalist think, or if it's really arctostaphyli. Uh, but in any case, whenever you see just like a regular manzanita with these bright red shoots, uh, that is a really cool fungus. Uh, there's another one that attacks the huckleberries around us. And I forget the name of that, something columnaris, but it makes the, uh, the huckleberry stems really thick and they almost look like beeswax candles. I saw some uh, about 100 yards over there. Uh, but another really cool thing to look out for. Super common. You'll see it everywhere once you recognize it. It's called witch's broom? Yeah, witch's broom. Okay. And um, I put some onto the little microscope. Uh, what's that one? That's what I was calling it, but then when I put it on iNaturalist, they're trying to call it something else. So I'm not even going to try to assign names until I get some sequence data back. But that's definitely one of the ones that it might turn out to be. I think uh, there's some of them that were saying it was like Coletosporium or something. I don't know much about those things. Uh, but he and here's some more of these paniolas. Uh, these are the blue staining paniolas. So these uh, stain blue very strongly and grow on cow manure and they have your the spotted gills. Uh, so maybe paniola cyanescens or something in that group. I have a question. Yeah. That one, I don't remember if I tasted it. If I did, it'd be in my iNaturalist notes. Um, I, I always try to taste everything, so it's very likely that I tasted it, but occasionally I forget. Uh, but that's one reason I like the iNaturalist app so much, because I'll take a quick cell phone picture of everything, and then I'll taste it, and then I'll record the taste and the texture and the nearby trees and anything that's not visible in the photos, just in the notes field. Because if I taste it and then like, just take pictures of it with my camera. By the time I upload the pictures, I'll forget what the taste was. We um, found some in, um, on pine cones. And they're spicy, right? Which is different, yeah, and they're spicy. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, so my guess is that it was spicy, but yeah, I'll have to look up at my, look up at my notes and see. Um, lots of spicy mushrooms, like uh, even those, uh, like Artemises, also are really spicy, like Rusula. Uh, here's some Morkella Americana. And this is a photo I took in Washington a few months ago. 
kind of a nice cluster of it. These are real common in Oregon and Washington under cottonwoods in May and higher elevations in June. And here's a really cool one um, that I've been looking for for a long time and finally started finding it this summer. Um, this one I photographed at Mount Hood a month ago. And this one is uh, Polyazelis atro atrolazulinus. And so we got three of the Polyazella species um, on the West Coast. They're the blue chanterelles or black chanterelles. So it's different than a black trumpet. And that these are related to Thelephora. Um, so I didn't know which one I found until last night. We, uh, I scoped the dried material for this and the spores were really small. So that means it is Polyazelis atrolazulinus. Was that by teacup? Uh, yes, it was right by teacup. Yeah. Uh, I also saw it at Pioneer Woman's Grave, that's a few miles away from teacup. Okay. Um, so it seems like it's having a pretty good year. Um, but we walked around uh, Mount Hood for several days about a month ago and it was really dry. And um, we found really good species diversity right there at teacup and almost nowhere else. Here's a spirea. Um, so I found this and uh, showed it to Rishi who showed up and she said it was a spirea and then the people on iNaturalist said spirea de glacii. Uh, also mm -hmm. from Teacup Lake, just thought it was a cool flower. So I picked it and photographed it with the black felt behind it. And then this one is really tiny. And so um, I found this at Mount Shasta. And it was real small, about a centimeter across. And I just felt sorry for it. And so, <laughs> and so I took a picture with my iNaturalist app, but then I also took a focus stacked photo of it. Because, um, you know, these tiny white spored things on mushrooms, uh, when I found it, I thought it was Crepidotus, because you could see it starting to turn yellow a little bit on the inside. So I figured that was spores maturing. Um, so, you know, I always feel sorry for Crepidotus because there's so many of them and they're so cool, but nobody ever studies them. So um, sequenced it, but it turned out it was not Crepidotus. It was actually a Pleurocybella, uh, but it only matched like 82% with Pleurocybella porogens, which is really far away. So I guess it's an undescribed Pleurocybella. Um, and I don't think it gets much bigger than this, but it probably is pretty common and just uh, often overlooked. And then here's one that I found like two weeks ago in North Carolina. And when I found it, I thought it would be um, Cordyceps tenuopes. And it was on this, uh, this beetle here, Coleoptera. And so I photographed it and uh, posted it to my Facebook profile and said, look at this cool Cordyceps tenuopes I found. But then all the Cordyceps experts uh, responded and Jeff Manganero said that it was uh, Cordyceps memorab memorabilis because of the orange, uh, orange uh, stems here. And um, so Cordyceps tenuopes has yellow stems, Memorabilis has orange stems, and then Richard Tehan, who studies these things really in depth, said it was probably undescribed. So I'm glad I saved this one. And then I took a whole bunch of pictures around North Carolina just of streams and stuff. And I found that the optimum exposure time for taking a picture of a stream is between a quarter second and one second. So if you just take like a real quick photo of a stream, then you see the individual droplets. And if you take like a 20 second exposure or photo of a, dream, of a stream, then um, all of the water just kind of blends together. But if you take a, open the shutter for between a quarter second and one, one second, then the water looks really cool. And then here is a Flebia incarnata, and I found this in Oaxaca a few months ago. This is a parasite on Sterium, so we don't get it here on the West Coast. Um, but it's really common in the Midwest and the East Coast and all over Mexico. And then here is a Hexagonia herta. It's one of my favorite polypores. Uh, it just has really cool hexagon-shaped pores. I found this in Oaxaca about two months ago. It's going to get pretty big. It always looks really cool. Uh, it does not look cool until you flip it over. Just from the top, it looks like a really boring turkey tail or something. And then this is a kind of cool plant. Um, a lot of times when you're hiking in California, you'll smell a whole lot of weed. And you'll be like, hey, who's growing weed? And it turns out nobody's growing weed. You just stepped on some Neveradia. So this one is Neveradia squarosa. 
and it has like all these trichomes. So under a microscope, it looks just like something out of High Times. Um, but really a cool smelling plant. It smells just like a skunk, but kind of, kind of like a mix between skunks and pine trees. Um, just smells like really high quality cannabis. Here's another good one. This is a coyote mint. This the, the the dank one you just showed. Is that in cannabis today or the same family? I think it is. I don't know my plant families very well, but um, it's either there or kind of looks like the Laming ACA looking at those flowers. I'll have to look it up again. The stem square? I don't remember. But yeah, to find those families, I always just look stuff up on Wikipedia. It seems to be the best place to find that stuff. Here's a Panis Concatus. These are usually pretty boring, but when they first start out, they're really cool looking. So it's kind of like, they call them like a wood oyster. And uh, they have this super uh, fuzzy blue foot. And I found this when I was out with Alison Polak. Um, she's a really good slime mold photographer, and she refuses to photograph anything that's bigger than one centimeter. <laughs> uh, so all of her photos are focus stacked, and uh, she's really fun to hunt with because we'll just go out and sit down in front of a log and take the log apart, and after about four hours, we've moved about six feet and, and photographed about 10% of what's in that log, and we find the coolest stuff. And I find that it's actually really hard to get good photos of large mushrooms. Uh, the smaller a mushroom is, the easier it is and the cooler the photos turn out. So, um, so it's photographing really tiny mushrooms. Um, you know, like the thing about a tiny mushroom is they're pretty much always pristine. And so you find them and there's really not much that can happen to them or else they'd be totally gone. So, you know, a macro photo of it will just look like some exquisite thing. Whereas big mushrooms, like they've had several days for them to get rained on, for the bugs to come along. And, you know, they're kind of hard to set up and it's just difficult to get a really high quality photo of a big mushroom. Um, but Alison Pollock is awesome. And if you're not following her on Instagram, you should. She is Marin Mushrooms. And her, um, her photography is just spectacular. And I'm also, also I'm teaching a photography class with her in Wisconsin next September. Here is some Phyllotopsis nidulans, like mock oyster type thing. Um, so this, uh, it was really dry and I just flipped over a log and this is one of the most common mushrooms that you see during drought. And underneath the log was a spectacular fruiting of Phyllotopsis nidulans. And so these things, they smell like coal tar some people eat them anyway, and they don't seem to poison you, but they smell really bad. And here is Flamulina mexicana. Uh, so this is uh, closely related to the Flamulina volutipes or Flamulina filiformis that we see around here, but it only grows at the tops of the volcanoes in Mexico. So Mexico is covered with the volcanoes, and at the base of the volcanoes it's kind of tropical, but the tops of the volcanoes get snow. And uh, in fact, I met somebody who froze to death that night on one of those volcanoes. And um, so th this is a very cold weather mushroom. And um, yeah, really cool little enoki type thing. Met him beforehand? Uh, yeah, we're just hiking and we met this guy and he was really cool. So I got his Facebook info and sent him a friend request. And then like four days later, everyone was posting RIP on his profile. And he froze to death the night that we met him. Uh, this was like 2012, and uh, yeah, it was Pico de Orizaba, which was the tallest volcano in Mexico. And driving up there was one of the craziest drives. Like, I cannot believe that my Jeep actually made it up this thing. Um, and uh, at the top, you know, there's a lot of snow, and there's this like little orange house where all the climbers stay in, and then before they summit it the next day. And I guess this guy just couldn't find the house when the sun set and just froze. Hmm. And here is an orchid. Um, there's a lot of orchids in Mexico. This one I found in the state of Puebla, uh, one of these really cool terrestrial orchids. So most orchids, they grow up in trees, and I think Mexico has several hundred species of orchids, but this is one of the orchids that grows directly on the ground. And so here's Joey, and Joey makes the Crime Pays Botany Dozen videos, and he's making a video about this orchid. Um, so if you go to his channel, you can you can find the videos. They're really good. 
Um, he kind of has this mobster persona, and all this gangster wants to do is teach you botany. <laughs> and they're full of profanity, so they're very entertaining videos. Um, and so he is super dedicated to plants. And so um, I've been going around with him for probably five or six years now, and I learned a lot about botany from this guy. And he's getting into mushrooms a lot too, so we made a bunch of cool mushroom videos this summer as well. Um, the still also be Zapatacorum video that we made this summer is really good. And then here is a Passiflora, so a passion fruit one. Uh, this isn't the really yummy passion fruit that we buy in the store, the store, uh, the stores, but <laughs> this, uh, this passion fruit is kind of bitter, but some of my friends eat it anyway. Uh, but really cool looking thing, so I threw it on some black velvet and photographed it. Here is Merasmius rotula. Uh, so little tiny marasmias. I like how this one turned out. It looked like it's made of porcelain. Um, so this one I photographed in Sierra de Quila, Jalisco. Um, but I saw some today as well. So it's got a really wide distribution. And really tiny thing. And here's another one that I like a lot. This one is the Romeria eriospora. Eriospora. And so this is one of the easier Romerias to identify because we only have maybe two or three red Romerias on the West Coast. And I cooked this one up and it's really good. Uh, I think most Romerias are reasonable edibles, but I really enjoyed this one. And here's some Rusula dissimulans uh, stems, or uh, gills. And so, um, you know, Rusula dissimulans are really big mushrooms and it's hard to take a good photo of them, but just zooming, uh, so I took my macro lens, focused it all the way close and then did a focus stack on the gills and ended up looking really cool. Um, this one is one of these rusulas where when you scratch it, it turns bright blood red. And then with ultraviolet light, you get this bright green color. And so I gave a piece to Hart who sequenced it and it turns out that it matches with the rusula dissimulans from Europe. So um, this is one of our uh, definitely the most common black staining rusula that we have here in Washington. And you can identify it pretty easily because when you scratch it, it turns bright red before it turns black. The Nagirakans group um, just goes directly black without the red. And also the gills are really widely spaced on this. So when you see these things with the really widely spaced gills, you know that it's the simulans and it's gonna turn red when you scratch it. Here is Salvia divinorum, which is the hallucinogenic uh, plant um, in the Lamiaceae. Uh, that's found in only in one mountain range in the world. So this is found in Sierra Mazateca, which is the place um, that people have been using magic mushrooms for thousands of years. And so this plant has an extremely strong hallucinogen in it. And uh, a lot of the books say that it's never been found in the wild, though when I went and was hunting mushrooms there, I found it in the wild in a couple places. Uh, some of them were really far off any trail, so I think I did find some wild ones. Uh, but this one got grown in my friend's garden. Um, and you can see, you know, it looks really cool because it's focus stacked and I did manual focus all the way close and then I took the lights and I put the lights behind it. So it gives it really nice depth. Um, so focus stacking flowers is a really good idea. However, it's almost impossible out in, the, in nature because they're always blowing in the wind. And if the subject moves while you're trying to focus stack it, then that's a real problem and it doesn't come out well at all. Now, if your whole camera moves, that's much less of a problem because the computer can compensate for that. But if the camera stays still and the subject moves, then it's just going to get like a 100 images superimposed. So to get images like this, I take them and I bring them indoors and just like put it in a flower vase and then set up some black velvet behind it and some lights. And then you can focus stack flowers to your heart's content. And it takes like two or three extra minutes, but it's so worth it when you see the results. So the Selvia divinorum does not flower very often, but when it does, it's pretty cool. And here are some damselflies. Um, these were from California a couple months ago up in the Sierra. Uh, dragonflies have two pairs of wings. Damselflies have just one pair of wings. And here's the most common snowmelt slime mold. This one is Arceria versicolor. I have no idea why they called it Versicolor, because it's kind of all one color. Uh, but when the snow melts in the spring, this, uh, this is super common. It's on like almost every log. And um, looks really cool if you focus stock it and focus them with the mangle focused all the way close. 
And then here is one of my favorite Mycenas. This is Mycena strilbanoides. And I found this last year at Mount Rainier. So, um, you know, it looks really cool. Let's see if I can find, can you see, almost. Uh, you can almost see that uh, the gill edges are very bright orange. And so I find, when I find stuff, I like to photograph it as it is, uh, just in the habitat. And then I um, take a few more and set them down in front of those. So then I get another photo where you can see all of the parts of the mushroom in the same picture. And then I throw it in a talcum box, bring it back. And so this is the gill edge magnified a thousand times. And you can see the reason that it's bright orange is because it has these really awesome orange chylocystidia. And so this is the gill edge just uh, magnified a hundred times. So that's like the whole gill there. I uh, just grabbed the gill with the tweezers, threw it on the slide. Um, and then I started to um, do, just look at the very gill edge. And that's these here. I really like the texture on those. Uh, and then I pressed down pretty hard on the gill edge with a pen. And that was, is what uh, is called a crush mount. And it breaks all the cells apart. And that way you can see the whole cell. So normally you just see the tops of the chylocystidia sticking out, and that's not good if you want to measure or see the whole shape of the chylocystidia. So the crush mount breaks all the cells apart, so you get this debris, debris field, and then you can actually see the whole cell. And we'll probably be doing that until about midnight or later tonight. Um, this thing is kind of cool. This is uh, Mycena stylobates. And this one I found at Point Reyes. And um, it's this really tiny Mycena. Uh, one way you can tell it's Mycena is because it has a basal disc. And so uh, a lot of Mycenas have that, where they, uh, just at the base of the stem, there's this big disc. Uh, but the cool thing about this is that it glows in the dark. And so I brought these home, because um, I didn't want to wait around in the forest until it got dark. I just brought them home in my taco box and threw them on some black velvet and photographed them um, on my floor and then did a long exposure. And you can see in the long exposure, the Douglas fir needles are glowing nice and brightly. So that's bioluminescence that's making its own light. Um, they're not fluorescent at all, so nothing happens in ultraviolet. But you can also see the mushrooms here, they kind of have like, a, they look like ghosts, kind of like a shadow. So the mushrooms are not glowing at all, and only the mycelium is glowing. Mm. Uh, in some species, only the mushroom cap glows. In other species, everything glows. In other species, only the gill edges glow, or only the gill edges, or in some species, only the stem glows. Here's a bovista found in Telluride, Colorado, a couple months ago. Um, kind of a small puffball, sort of boring, because it's real little, but with ultraviolet light, it's beautiful, especially when you cut it open. Mm -hmm. And this is one of my favorite things. This is Tilichildium brachiatum. So it's a parasite on some kind of little mushroom. This one I found on the Oregon coast at Cape Perpetua. And so it looks really cool as is, but looks even cooler in ultraviolet light. I think someone found that today. I saw a photo. Oh, awesome. Yeah, we should definitely take a look at it with the black light. Here is the uh, Tilipocladium. Uh, this one's like Tilipocladium capitatum. And uh, when you see one of these, you want to dig it up because they're always fruiting from these underground truffles. And so these truffles are called alaphomycetes. They taste disgusting, so they're really yucky truffles. Uh, but you can cut them open and then see the inside of the truffle, so that's always fun to do. And these are always cool. This is a tulistoma. And so tulistomas are the little puff balls and sticks. They're really common out in the desert, though these I found um, in Amsterdam. And this is something that people have been reporting around the campsite here. This is usnea, and it has a chemical called usnic acid. And usnic acid is very water soluble and also very fluorescent. So the usnea itself is not particularly fluorescent when it's dry, but as soon as it gets wet, you get the usnic acid gets into solution. And then as it drips off, it glows really well in ultraviolet light. So there's the same photo with white light and ultraviolet light. And that's something you'll see really commonly is that stuff that's fluorescent, it's like sort of fluorescent, but then if you can dissolve it into solution, then you get beautiful colors. Um, morels are a good example. If you take a morel and you just shine a black light on it, you see kind of some bluish, greenish colors, but it's kind of faint. 
And then if you take a morel and you dissolve it in isopropanol and then shine an ultraviolet light through the isopropanol, you get the most beautiful cobalt blue color. And so I think that works on a lot of different things. Here's one of my favorite uh, lichens. I think this one's like Sphorosphora tuckermanopsis. And so just like vaguely boring uh, without ultraviolet light, but with ultraviolet light, it looks like something under the sea, like a jellyfish. And a lot of plants are kind of cool with ultraviolet lights. Um, this one is Viola glabella, and it's a violet. But most plants, they will glow red, or they have some pro protective waxes that block ultraviolet to give them protection from the sun so they don't glow at all. But for some reason, this plant glows bright blue. And the undersides of the leaf glow bright red, so it makes for some cool-looking photos. Here is an acanthomyces. This is an undescribed acanthomyces that's super common in the eastern United States. I found it in West Virginia about two weeks ago. And uh, pipe vine swallowtail caterpillar, also from West Virginia a couple, a couple weeks ago. Uh, these occur out here as well. They make beautiful blue butterflies. And here is cordyceps tenuopes. So this one was growing right out of a stick and so I used the razor blade to very carefully slice the stick until I could see the insect that was growing inside. Uh, these are cool because they are Loretomyces, um, Loretomyces squamosis. And um, with ultraviolet, you can see they have very fluorescent chylocystidia. And this is just what the mushrooms look like. So these are all over the East Coast. They're having a really good year right now. So these I found in West Virginia. Um, but I just love how they look in ultraviolet. And here is a Lycoperdon perlatum. Uh, pretty cool standard puffball thing. Looks really good with uh, macro lens. And here's a Basidio lichen, Multiclavula mucida. So most uh, lichens are ascomycetes, uh, but this particular one is a Basidiomycete. Here's a Foliotina. Maybe the real Foliotina rugosa. <laughs> so, little tiny thing, really fragile, kind of deadly. It's got alpha ammonite in it, same toxins as Amanita, uh, as Amanita phylloides. I found a bunch of them in West Virginia um, a couple weeks ago. How many should, would you be able to eat? Uh, I think you probably have to eat about 50 or 100 to get poisoned. Um, you know, with a big mushroom like Amanita phylloides, you can get poisoned by just one. But tiny mushrooms like Gallerina or Foliotina, they dry down to like almost nothing, so they don't have very much weight. So you would have to eat quite a, quite a few of them. Um, in fact, a lot of old field guides from Europe list Gallerina marginata as an edible species, because people would eat a few of them and they'd be fine. But then if they ate a whole bunch of them, they would die. A few small dogs have passed, passed away. Dogs died in Bellingham from eating uh, or Foliotinas on the lawn. Oh, wow. Um, so I wonder which one that was, because uh, I guess that was almost certainly Cornosobia opala. Um, but dogs eat Cornosobia opala all the time, and um, they don't usually die or even get sick. Usually nothing happens. So usually when dogs eat Cornosobia opala, I tell them that's no problem. So maybe it was actually Rugosa, because that's the amatoxin-containing one, because, yeah, dogs are pretty sensitive to amatoxins. The much more common uh, can also be Apollo. It has phallotoxins, which are also an amanita phylloides, but those are destroyed by your stomach acids. So you eat them and nothing happens. Here's a really cool polypore, uh, Plicodropsis crispa. This one was growing on beach. And so on the upper left, you can see the uh, top of the polypore and then the, on the, uh, the others is the underside. So I like to take my polypore photos where you can see the top and the underside in the same photo. Here's a slime mold, Staminitis, chocolate tube slime. And this thing is kind of cool. It's uh, from out east, it's Tectella, Tectella patellaris. And so it's a gilled mushroom that's really small and has this, this gelatinous veil that covers the gills when it's young. I actually have a question about the steminitis. Yeah. Yeah, I've seen it before where it's like, when I first saw it, it was like this beautiful 
bright pink and then I like took a picture of it and then the next day I went and looked at it and it turned to that dark brown. Do you yeah. know anything about what causes that color change or what that's about? Yeah, well those things make really good pets and they start out as like plasmodium and mm. then they kind of like, uh, so it's like these kind of like little river things and then they'll, they'll form these little balls and then the balls elongate and they get these kind of like, you know, kind of projections that are bright red and then like a couple days later then they mature and the plasmodium becomes uh, mixed spores mm. and so that's like all the different phases of its life cycle so when you find it in its plasmodium phase they're impossible to identify without dna sequencing because a lot of slime molds look the same and um, then if you can get some mature ones then you can do microscopy and even with macro identification you can identify a lot of them um, so yeah, it's like these amoeba-like organisms kind of getting together and organizing and then finally um, making these spore-bearing structures. Mm. When I found these, I only found it in the final form. Tectel has been found in Washington before. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I don't see it very often at all. Yeah, I found it in Washington when I saw it so I could shoot the pictures I have and maybe you could uh, take a look. Yeah. Here's the real cordyceps tenuapes with the yellow stem. That's on a Lepidoptera pupae. And here's a really nice one. This one is like Lactarius indigo. And so these things are bright blue. And when I found it, there was only one mushroom. And so I'm like, oh man, how do I take a good picture of that? So I just like zoomed way in on the gills. And was able to make it look pretty reasonable for one mushroom. It looks really good. Thank you. Uh, here is Psilocybe neohalapensis, and uh, this I photographed uh, a couple months ago, and um, it was a really rainy day, and so when I got out there, it was raining really hard, and so I'm image stacking this, and I shot, shine some really bright lights on them from below, because I have these awesome purple gills that light up, um, but you can see the raindrops got captured in some of the images that were part of the photo stack, so I liked how that looked. <coughs> And this one's kind of cool, this is Protubera. And so Protubera are like stink horns, but they never actually open up and make any kind of fruiting body. They're just like stink horn eggs that are just permanent stink horn eggs. And um, so you cut it open and shine a bright light on it. And they have this really cool kind of semi-translucent texture on the inside. And then I took the light and put it on the other side and then you can see it from that way. And it's freezing. I think we're almost done, but I've got to show you a couple more things. This is a Selegionella. And so Selegionella, they look pretty boring like this. I mean, it's actually pretty cool, but with ultraviolet light, they're spectacular. So they're like a really big mosses. And I see them all over the place in Mexico. I think they're around here too. Here's some Psilocybe zapaticorum that I found just in the middle of the trail in Mexico a couple months ago. I think I made this one, the Wikipedia official picture for Zapatacorum. And this thing I really liked a lot. There were these uh, caterpillar uh, pupa. And when I found them, they looked like they were made of silver. Mm. So the, you know, it looks like they were just forged of pure silver. Mm. And um, they were just like hanging out under a leaf. And so I brought the leaf back and a couple hours later, they'd almost hatched out and they looked like this. So mm. you can start to see the butterfly wings mm. um, shining through the silver. But then I had to leave Mexico before they could hatch, so I didn't get to see the butterflies, but my friends did. And that is the last slide I have for you. Thank you very much. Mm.